So here I am with former Manchester United legend Gordon Hill. Gordon, what's it like being back? I don't think the word legend is what I look at. I call it the leg end. You know, I'm the left leg end and Stevie was the right leg end. But uh, it's lovely to be back in Manchester and it's always nice to go back to a place where you, you, you left your dreams and you played your dreams and your memories. And for me, my favourite, I think, was I always, when I put my squad of players that I bring over onto the, onto the field to see Old Trafford, to take them on a tour, for me, I sit there in the stand and I watch all the ghosts that have played before on that hallowed turf and the games that I played in and the games that, that the players prior to me, Dennis Law, Bobby Charlton, I look at the goals and the goal mouth where I, where, where I scored a few goals and it's just absolutely, it's thrilling, but it's my own thrill, it's my own memory. I, you know, I'm, I'm talking about it now, but that, that memory is with me. That memory is that, you know, it may be empty, may not have 65, 75,000 people in it, but for me, it's sitting there and, and going over things and looking down where, where, where you could have, you know, scored or, or you could have, where you got tackled and uh, how's it's changed and the height of the ground. You look at all those things, but then if you look around on a, and, and what I, call, I call it the haze, I can look around and see different ghosts of different players that played there. And it's just, it's just a fantastic, fantastic atmosphere. Even a private one. I'm making a TV series called The Religion, and I call it The Religion because for me, you've got these fans from around the world who come to worship their team. You've got these legends like gods looking down on the stadium, like Lord Best and Charlton. And it's very, there's a lot of parallels between football and religion. It's not a religious thing, but it unites people, doesn't it? For people from all different walks of life. Yes, supporting United is a religion. You know, it's an, it, the club is an institution, regardless. And when I look at it, I think this club will go on regardless because it is part and, part and parcel and the history of football. It's been at the top of the football game. It's been to the lower parts with the Munich. It's had great managers. It's had great players. And I think what it does, it, it has its troughs of ups and downs, but it's still, it's still on everybody's tongue and it slips off quite well when, you know, who do you support United? And that's not taken away from City. City are phenomenal, they're great, they're having a great time. But United, it's, you're a red or a blue. And, and you know, fortunately for us, and fortunately for myself, I, ha I happen to be part of that. And the players before me have made up that big puzzle, that big picture that you see. So when we talk about being a, a, a you know, do I support United? It's, it's, it's much deeper than that. I am United. Even though I may be a small part of it, the players before me, the Laws, the Choltons, uh, the Pearsons, um, you know, uh, all these players, the Cantonars, we are, we are all part of it that make up that big picture that we have today in excelling in the standard and the quality that the club has always brought. And if you slip off that, you've got a problem. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, because for me, it doesn't matter who owns the football club, they're just no. the custodians. That's right. For me, the football club belongs to the fans and the former players. And you see yes. first time when you come back, how much people remember you. Well, the, the nice thing is that, is that I, was, I was in my room and an envelope came underneath my door 30, 35 years, 40 years later. And it was a supporter that wanted some photographs, you know, and it's, it's, it's lovely. You know, it's not, oh, I, you know, that's fantastic. It was, wow. You know, I normally come, I normally do my training, I normally take the squad down to Old Trafford, I show them my, 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 my home. Um, and, and they go around, they see the tour, they see the museum, uh, they go on the tour, they go in the changing rooms, you know, and you just have to look at the smile and, and, the, and the feelings and the, and the talking, and they're sitting in the dugout, and, and the, and all of a sudden they're looking at the field where they, they may watch it on the TV at the weekend. I was there, I was there, you know. And I just look there and I just go, wow, this is what this club is all about. And in, it's, it's a, to me it's, it's an institution and uh, I think it's getting bigger. I think it will always be that way. And to me, you know, way after I'm gone, there'll be players that will be playing there and, you know, it's renowned for entertainment and football. It is, they call it the theatre of dreams. 
I call it my theatre of memories because and there's going to be memories and there's going to be there's going to be players there's going to be football down there that excites everybody and you're not going to please everybody it you know it's funny but opinions you sit there and you've got 65,000 managers that would do things differently but when you're on the field you don't hear those managers because you know you have to do a job and you know you've trained all week to do that job. And whether they're getting 5,000, 5 pound, 50,000, 100,000, they still have to do a job and satisfy people on a Saturday or at United. You, you, you know, I, I look at it, I, 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 look, I talk to the old, the former players, that was great. My, my favorite was sitting with the 48 team at the former Man United dinner. I, I'd sit there and listen to these guys. I sat with Bill Folks. I sat with Jack Crompton, Jimmy Curran. I mean, all these backroom players and people. Brian Kidd, who was a great player here. Um, Sir Alex, you know, um, Tommy Doherty. Sir Matt used to sit with, I used to sit with Sir Matt and have a quiet little chat with him. He's come into the ground. So it's a, it's one massive family. You can get on, you can't get on. You have an argument, you have an argument. You make up, it's your opinion, their opinion. But that's what makes this club so fantastic. And it's right what you said, John. The people who own the club are the custodians. They're very, very expensive landlords. This club will survive regardless of that. What I love about the former players, and you're very much one of these guys, mm -hmm. you're very down to earth. and. You, when you finish playing, you become fans, and I think that makes you closer to the fans. So, an event like tonight, do you enjoy that? When you think about it, down at the Blaze, next to Old Trafford, next to Lou Macari's Fish and Chip Shop, uh, it brings great memories when you drive down there and turn left and try and park the car before a game. Now you can't, the chauffeur takes you. But in our days, you know, it was like, oh, give us a lift to the ground, we've got a game uh, at three o'clock, so you'd meet at 12 o'clock. But um, Bishop Blaze is the home of United supporters. And so rightfully so, it's right next door to the ground. And so many great players, so many good players have walked past it and been in the pubs there and been in the fish and chip shops and, and match day, you know, have trodden that famous walk to, to, to Busby Way. I, I, just, I just like it. I just, you get a feeling that it is a club that you love you know, and I've been part of it and I always, I will always feel part of it. And saying that, I'll always be part of Millwall because that's where I learned, that's where I learned to walk in the pro world. That's where I got your Harry Cripses and your Kitcheners uh, having a go at you. And that's, that's your grounding, you know, coming from Millwall to Man United and finding out the first time that I thought that Watford Gap, anything further than that was funny land. But then you come out of it, you see it, and the people up here are fantastic. But then you, you, you get a, a, a good grip of everything because you're playing all over the country. You're going to these grounds. You're going to see their people, their supporters, your supporters. And it's great. We take so many supporters. Millwall came to Man United when they got their, prom their promotion. We got hammered 4-0. We are called the Lions. But it felt like we were the Christians because we got mullered, absolutely mullered. And I took, that was my stage. I knew that's where I wanted to play. And I was very fortunate enough that I, I, you know, I was allowed to do that. One thing I have to ask you about, because one of my favourite memories growing up watching Man United play was that semi-final against Derby County when you scored both those goals. Wow. Your best game at United? No, I've had some great games at United. And, and I think every game I play for United with a red shirt on is a great game, whether I play good or bad, because I had the shirt on. Um, yeah, that, that game there was, Derby were going for about two or three trophies at the time. Um, the, the, one I, the memory I do remember about that, we, we pulled the coach right next door to the the entrance into the changing rooms because you, if you pulled anywhere else you wouldn't have got into the changing rooms and um, Leighton James was giving the tickets out to his people from Derby and Charlie George was there, great player Charlie and uh, Leighton turned around and as we got off the bus and walking down he turned around and said it's not worth you turning up 
and Charlie George absolutely ripped into him and said, you stupid, beep, beep, beep. He said, now you're, he said, now you're going to wind them up. So after the game, we'd got the result after the game and, uh, and walking past Leighton and I went, thanks for the game, Leighton. And Charlie George wouldn't talk to him because he he said, don't wild them up, you know. And Derby had great players, Colin Todd, Roy McFarlane, David Nish. You, so you're not, you weren't talking about, you're talking about internationals and, uh, and Dave Mackay. And it was one of these where, you know, hey, these young pups have come to play. And, and TD was proud to have us. But then when that was said to us going down the tunnel, I, little Louis said, oh my God, he said, if one of you had said that, we'd have gone absolutely bonkers. He said, but I tell you what, at the end of it, it was like, thanks for the game, boys. And I always remember coming out afterwards and getting in the coach to come back to Mottram. And we, and, and people were, we were sitting in the coach and the coach is elevated, the seats are elevated and looking out, we looked and all of a sudden the guy, a guy was trying to get out with his car. I think it was a BMW. He was trying to get out of the car park with his car. Well, United supporters wanted to get as close to the bus as possible. And all of a sudden they were jumping, they were jumping on this car. And Sammy, myself and that were looking at it and this car was slowly sinking as the roof went in. It was like, it was going, we couldn't say get off, but it was, they were so elated that we were back into a final, going to Wembley, you know, after, you know, from 68, if you think, right away to 75, going back to Wembley, going down a division, they came storming back, I joined them, they made a, made a, young, a young team, they were, we, we, we played with panache, we played with speed, we played, we played 100 mile football, controlled. And I think that's what people liked and loved about it. And, but that was, a, that was a Man United way. You know, you had Bestie, you had Cholton, you had Law. You watched some of their games, so thrilling. But then you're part of it in your own side, and then you're part of it in the next side. Then Fergie came into, onto the scene, created it with the six. And then all of a sudden, surrounding himself with the Keens, with the uh, Smichaels, um, Cantonars. Now all of a sudden, you've got another team that can do a lot of damage. Football has a funny way of letting clubs have that. And that was that. That was ours. And at this moment in time, and I'm up to date now, it's a, we've got to sit there and sit, and, and City are having it. And Liverpool are reviving it. But we cannot stay away from it. We have to be knocking on the door all the time. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. It's hard to imagine in the modern era, United getting relegated. I know you didn't get relegated, but for me as a fan, a lot of fans remember very fondly the Tommy Doherty era because it was such an exciting time with oh my gosh. you and Stevie Coppel on the wings. And well, if you remember, John, we saw you. I saw United uh, when they went down. I saw United in the second division. You know they were coming to ground, and everybody uh, at the end of the season, everybody turned round. All the clubs in the t- said, "Please don't let United get promotion." So I said, "Why is that? You know, they're the best team. We're not talking about the best team, but they bring ten thousand people to the stadium, and that's revenue for us." So they were so anti. But to be honest with you, it was like I played against them twice. I played them I, the second time against at Millwall. Uh, it was one nil, and and I had an absolute cracking. I was pleased with that. But the first game at Old Trafford, I, I stood out on that field and it was like, holy moly, you know, instead of Cold Blow Lane, Stre- you know, it was, you know, the Stretford End. And they, they weren't for you. You know, you, we had a white shirt on, they had a red shirt on. Next time we had a, a, our white shirt on, they had the red shirt on. And after that, I had a red shirt on. And, I, and then I felt it. And it was like, it's like someone was saying to me, the number 11, and don't forget, very hard to replace George. I wasn't there to replace George. I was there to create myself and play myself. And I just put that 11 on at number 11. And I absolutely just went, tell you what, this fits me. This fits me. And up today now you have names on shirts and, 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 all, and, and 65s and 85s. No, in them days, if he wasn't in the first 11, you weren't playing. And so you'd always look at the team sheet and say, I'm number 11. And then we'd say, that's Hilly's shirt, that's Hilly's. So number 11 was renowned for that. Number 10 was renowned for it. So that had stigma with it. 
So I was so, so thrilled, you know, to put that 11 shirt on. We're not going to go into the personal stuff, but I know mm -hmm. your teammates were absolutely gutted when Tommy Doherty left the football club because they all mm. felt you had a chance of winning the league the next season. We, we, were, we, were, we were primed for it. We, you know, we knew what Liverpool were. Um, I think Shankly said to, that Shanks has said to the team there, there's a team from down the East Lanks Road that's coming to take the title. We felt it, we knew it, but unfortunately, uh, you know, and again, circumstances beyond our control pushed and had the destiny of the club. So that's why I, I now, what will be, will be. I, you know, I, I don't get involved in it. But I, I, you know, I like to see, I'm, I'm a footballer through and through. I, I live, eat and breathe it. I'm an ambassador for the game. I'm in America where I'm an ambassador for the game. I'm also a coach. I'm also a developer. That's, that's me. I, that, I never change. I can't be anything else. But, but that situation damaged us because we had done so well. And, and the team was, we were just getting stronger. We were all early 20s. We were getting stronger and stronger. You know, we took Juventus and Juventus knew we were coming at them. And we, we, we lost to Porto. We played Ajax, the great Ajax, with a couple of their players. I think Cruyff had gone to Barcelona. They knew we'd come to, they, they knew we were coming to play. Sinetian, all these teams knew, the German teams knew that we weren't coming to play. We were coming to win. And I think that's what, nowadays, that's what our mentality in today's game has got to get back to. It's got to get back to that winning mentality. And I think that with Oli, I think he's got to do exactly that. And hey, you can only back him and give him, you know, and say, listen, run with it. I mean, for me as a fan, it's beautiful to see him mm. giving the kids a chance. And we've done this so many times in the past with, with young players. And I think today people are very impatient and we haven't spent a lot of money in the transfer market. Well, we have, we have spent a lot of money, but we haven't spent as much as what some people expect to yeah. but you think we can do it with the kids? Well, the famous quote, Alan Hansen, you'll never do it with kids. Well, thanks, Alan, that's great. Why don't you say it again? Because that would bleed me to death. But then on the other hand, you're looking and saying, well, okay, fine. What have we got coming through? You've got Mason, Greenwood. You've got um, uh, the, about three or four others that I can't name at this moment, but I, I've, I've watched them. I see them in the youth games. Uh, and But you've got to remember, they've got to be of the highest standard for us to get back there. Because a lot of these, if they don't make it, go to other clubs that aren't on our level. When we got rid of a player, he went to somewhere else to learn his football, maybe to come back. David done that, David went to Preston, you know, and you loan players out to see if you can actually get them uh, that experience to come back and step up. And a lot of them go to other clubs. And a lot of them stay, uh, you know, and they say, well, but after a while, you can't sit on the bench. You might be getting 30 grand a week, 40 grand, it doesn't matter. But you don't want 30, 40 grand a week for sitting on the bench. That's if you're a professional player. You want to be playing. You'd rather be out there. So you've got to search for that. And I think it's come to a time now that United players, if they're not playing, will go. And I don't blame them for going. Because, because they want to pursue their professional career because it's a short one. And they want to pursue it and they want to push it forward. So for me, you know, it's great. Now talking about kids, we're here at Mottram Hall. Tell us about what you're doing in the modern day. Well, modern day, I, I'm, as I'm a developer, and, and it sounds, oh gosh, what is he doing? You know, build houses, no. What I do is I bring, I bring possible players to learn the culture and the desire and what it takes to get to another level in the game. Young American players that, that, that want to see it, uh, bring them over, put them through a tough sessions, let them see what the semi-pros are doing, let them see what the pros are doing, take them to games where there's plenty of talking and, and these players start to understand that, that there are four factors. There is um, technically, tactically, physically, psychologically. Technically, to look how good they are. Tactically, can they read a game? Physically, anybody can get them fit. The biggest question is the psychological side of it. Have they got that desire? And basically, all players are governed on that, every player. So when you see a player, and, you, and I develop all the time, youngsters right the way through the system, and I, I, and I work with the LMA, 
League Manners Association. And it's lovely because what you're doing is you're now looking at the next generation of player. But also what you're doing is looking at the younger generation that may be coming in to tomorrow's game. What's not making him move? Late developers, ones that don't make it but make it at a later age. All these elements come into it, but it, one thing's left. Are you looking at a player that wants it? Desire. And, you know, see people say to me, did I started at Southall for, for three months. Did I give up? No, never in a million years. You know, the game is always open to you. You're going to make those players move. Ian Wright. Righty, 24. Stevie Coppel saw him driving past a park. They are out there. It's just now you've got to say, OK, but we've now got a, another, not a problem, but now we've got foreign players coming in. As before, we had just mostly British. Now we've got foreign players coming in, which knocks down the, 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 the everyday player from the British Isles. This, the, the, it's down to about 20, 27%. So that means you've got to be very special about So I develop. I look at players, I look at how they can develop, and uh, I spend a lot of my time developing players. And I know the system inside out. We spent the day yesterday watching you and filming you working with the young guys. I mean, you obviously enjoy training oh, the kids. Love, I, I love it because the younger, they, the, 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 the smaller ones are untouched. They're untouched canvases. So your best coaches in a club should be at the bottom. Not at the top, because there are too many spots to change. So they should be at the bottom, John, and they should be concentrating on the basics, the elements, the control, pass and move. End of story. You can do those three, you can go anywhere in this world. So I think you've got to start learning that well, and you've got to start teaching that. But when you get a clean canvas, it's just lovely to see how they pick up their own mannerisms, their own ways they want to do it. Watch the television and they say, I'll do a Maradona, I'll do a Cruyff, I'll do a, you know, a Ronaldo, you know, and you just go, okay, fine. But that's their own little skills they learn. What you're giving them is the basics. So when that doesn't work, they come back to their basics and it'll never let them down. And I just love it. I, I mean, it's just, you know, uninhibited. And then all of a sudden they get to the structure and that sometimes hinders them. Can you see a day when you return here with a young player from America who can perhaps play in the Premier League and tell us about the, the, what you're doing over in America. We've now built an academy in um, Michigan, uh, just north of Chicago. Uh, we'll be housing about 20, about 24 to about 32 players and it will be like a boarding academy. It will be very similar structured as we do in the UK. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to offer them, we're partnering up with the um, university there so that they can do their schoolwork there but we've also got we've got a classroom we've got uh, laundry rooms medical rooms um, plyometrics rooms coaches and facilities for them to stay uh, we've got two fields that we're looking at that are finishing now we're looking at putting an indoor so that we'll have an all year round environment for the young players so that they'll eat breathe and sleep the game and then they'll be also be educated as well. So they'll be able to take a sports psychologist's classes and all this. So what we're doing is we're not saying, OK, this is football. Yes, it is. But what we're actually doing is saying your education is important. And they're doing it now. It's not, it's not a brand new thing. But with your own fields and your own, everything is in-house. And, and so basically we'll be looking we'll be looking for young players, talented players that you know, want to give it a crack at it. You know, I'm looking for that next generation of player that wants to be out. Say, I tell you what, hey, this kid's good. Because you never know until you start, you know, work, working with talent is, as, is very up and down. Some it might develop, others won't. All of a sudden, one will shoot and you go, whoa. So that's the unknown. But the academy will be all year round and they'll be living and eating, breathing under my direction and other coaches that we will bring in. Um, and it, it, it is in a very quiet place so that they can't go clubbing it, you know. This goes only once a month, <laughs> you know. So, but it, it is, a, a, if we're going to, if we're going to develop that player, you've got to develop that player where he's got to be committed to going to another level, another level, and absolutely go there. So we're delighted that we've started it now. 
we nearly, we nearly finished it. We're just at the finishing touches. So I'm going to be looking for players and players that wish to uh, uh, get in touch with us. You know, you can get in touch with me at gordonhill11.com, which is my website. And uh, you've got uh, my um, email address. You know, I'm not hard to get hold of. And uh, I'm just looking forward to like that next player. Mm, that's brilliant. Final 20 seconds. What would it mean to Gordon Hill to come back with a player for Manchester United? It's not, look at me, look at me. I don't care about me. I just want that player to go and just say, thank you. And then United to say, thank you. That's all it is. I don't want no more and nothing else. Brilliant. Good luck with it. Thank you. That's Gordon. Well done. <laughs>